If you had told me when I started this channel that at some point, I wouldn't just be talking about characters chasing down monsters and that I would instead become one, I don't know if I would have believed you. Maybe I could have entertained the thought of it for a moment. Sure, at some point, things might have gotten crazy enough to involve me, if it were close enough. A little field work in the backyard, maybe an hour's drive away or so, yeah. Playing scary games with scary game writers, a nice little nod to each other, broadcaster to creator. But you never could have told me it would come to all of this. On March 29th, 2016, I broke away from the formula I had begun with Nightmine for the first time. By that point, all I had done was cover Slenderman web series and Wham City comedy projects, with some new horror movie reviews thrown in. Jack Torrance Explained was my first real departure from what I knew and can be considered the premier Nightmine case file. By the point of my coverage, everything it was at first glance can be summed up best by the channel description, written in the About tab. These are movies that we found in 10 rather large boxes at an estate sale for 5 bucks a box. It was being held in a barn about 15 miles west of Austin, Texas. There were some old records, which we also bought, some rusted tools, tons of paint cans, various other bits of old useless junk, and these boxes. The people running the estate sale didn't seem to know that they were there and priced them for us on the spot. The films vary in formats ranging from old 35mm stock reels to Betamax. Many of the films are damaged beyond repair, but we are trying our best to repair and clean them up. As we dig through the boxes, catalog, and digitize more videos and audio, we will post more. This information was copied and pasted into the description section for almost every video uploaded. The only break in the pattern came with the appearance of four videos that broke another. From the beginning, the channel hosts had been true to their word, converting old obscure footage and uploading it for viewers, until they suddenly began showing footage of a home that was under construction. For these videos, there was no description, and the camera used was modern, with footage that was clearly recorded recently. Shortly after this run of modern videos, typical activity resumed and carried on for two months. And then, there was nothing. Jack Torrance began on December 29th, 2011, and uploaded a collection of creepy, weird, scary, obscure, and disturbing found footage clips over the course of three months. It came back two years and eight months later with an upload on November 29th, 2014 then carried through until March 17th, 2015 when it uploaded something truly significant and then vanished again. Almost one year later, it returned with modern footage of the house under construction on February 27th, 2016, uploading four videos about someone visiting the building, followed by more old film conversions that were posted between March 20th and May 23rd of 2016. This series appeared to be operating in cycles, playing dead or alive over the course of five years. And what exactly had we learned in all of that time? Not very much, or so it seemed. Jack Torrance was my first case file for a very good reason. Aside from what seemed to be a loose form of story, there appeared to be nothing discernible here. Scary found footage is all I was getting as a message, with some attempts to have a plot of some kind scattered throughout, but nothing concrete. I should have given it a lot more thought than I did. Hidden among all the odd and vague scary sights in the uploads on Jack Torrens were constant hints at occult activity caught on film and all of the attempts by those with cameras to catch more, all taking place in the area of Austin, Texas. Recordings of summoning boards like the Mystic Hand, appearances by robed figures in odd locations, investigations of dark buildings and graveyards by somebody who seems to keep showing up on camera, ritual items and strange altar configurations laid out, a ceremony or event being held in a very dark location that bears the mark of the Freemasons. And finally, moments of apparitions and even monsters caught on camera. It was entirely too easy to wave off Jack Torrance as a variety scare tactics channel. I had seen enough of them by the time I investigated to bear in mind that it very well could have just been going for as much clickbait as possible. And while I did put together that there seemed to be something to it, some kind of loose plot, I didn't really catch on until the under construction videos. One of the major questions that comes to mind immediately upon viewing Jack Torrance is whether the found footage is legitimately made using the media format described in the title of each video. During the house construction phase, we're shown it's wrong to doubt Jack. An old Super 8 camera is discovered inside the house by the modern investigator, along with the mystic hand summoning board and a happy birthday balloon, all revealed after a journey in the backyard that led to a small clown statuette placed inside a circle of stones. While we're never shown who or what put the items in the backyard and the house, we're made fully aware that the visitor is not alone. (laughs) 
It's right after this moment that normal footage uploads continue, the first being the sight of a wig from a much earlier video lying in the dirt, and the second showing off footage of the clown figurine. The videos began linking back to themselves, making it clear there was a line of events throughout. This was not as random as it seemed. And still, after initial coverage, I had moved on, only looking at Jack Torrance's new uploads with faint curiosity. It uploaded for a bit after my first video, stopped just a few months into its new cycle, and faded away, like it had been doing all along. And then, on the 4th of July, 2018, it came back with a demand. Find me. Two years and two months had passed since Jack had been active, and suddenly it had sent a notification to my phone about a live stream. Jack Torrance was not the kind of web series that would ever make a live stream. And yet here it was, demanding attention and getting across exactly one message. Find me. I dropped everything I was doing to watch, and then watched it again, and again, and again. The stream itself held nothing significant, at least nothing that could be seen very well at all in the dark. You could hear a lot of metal clicking, but that, mixed with some audio buzzing, was all viewers could really get enough of to say that they certainly knew, but it didn't even matter. The stream itself, its title, and the lack of a video description was significant. This was a massive pattern break that demanded my full attention. I went back through the videos that had come out since my first coverage of the channel two years prior, and I found something new that should have told me the story had drastically changed course. On April 24th, 2016, the video description, which had always been a copy of the About section summary, had been tampered with. Somebody had inserted the word help four times, trying to pass a message to the audience without being caught. This came well after the events of Under Construction, which you'll remember did not end well for the person wielding the camera, who we could assume to be the owner and operator of the Jack Torrance channel, when it first began. I put out the word as quickly as I could that Jack Torrance had come back with a vengeance, but not before deciding to play along by delivering a response. Whoever was running this channel now wanted action, Purely by going live, they were turning interactive, so I left a message calling their bluff. If they wanted to be found, I told them to make me come to Texas and find them. I advertised it in the update video too, just to be sure they got the message loud and clear. Two days later, a new video was uploaded showing off a building we hadn't seen on the channel before, and another secret message hidden in the video description. It is calling. Will you answer? They had seen my response and were calling my bluff in return. What Jack Torrance didn't know at the time was that my community had already joined me in the investigation effort to find out where Jack was. I had expressed in my update video that it had to be within the 15 mile range of Austin, Texas. And as everyone went on the hunt and tried to narrow down a search zone that we could actually work with, one of my viewers, Pouncing Dragon, got a solid hit. And then another. And then another. By the time Jack issued a challenge back to me about a field investigation, we had already found him. And while I was just fine letting him know that I was answering the call, I wasn't about to prove it or say when or how. With the invitation to play accepted and issued back officially, I was ready to make my opening move, and I wanted it to be as much of a surprise as Jack's for this phase of the whole case. A very unexpected live stream. On July 11th, I flew to Austin and met up with associates in the area who knew my work and were willing to join me on this adventure. The plan was to go out the very next day, visit the locations revealed, catch footage, and then play our first move on the live stream. On that day, there were four locations found as solid hits matching areas recorded in Jack Torn's videos and associated media, and I have evidence of all of them. The first two, however, turned out to be far more public and way more dangerous for strangers in Texas carrying cameras than my investigation team and I liked, and due to the nature of those places, I still don't feel comfortable giving them away. But I will say this. One of them is the Jack Torrance house, which you can see in the channel banner and profile picture. Yes, we did in fact find that house. Too bad it's on the same property as a very much active home with people living inside who probably did not like being recorded for the internet. We were able to showcase two of the four locations from that day, however, and prove our point, including the location of the building from the last video Jack had posted, calling me back on my bluff to see if I'd really do this, which was discovered at the end of day one and had to be recorded on day two, delaying the first live stream. Location one was a church that had been seen in the video Fragment 52P, uploaded on May 23rd, 2016. It's easily identifiable and located in Georgetown, Texas, north of Austin.
Location 2 is related to more than one Jack Torrance video, but the main hit was Fragment 78P from March 27, 2016, also in Georgetown. So once again, we're going to go through the relevant portion of the footage from the original video. I want everybody to really look at this place, study it as you're watching it. And this spot in particular. Notice the car. Notice the layout of the open spaces and the walls. Notice that door and that window. And again, just for reference, really take this in here. So, once again, left-hand side of the screen, the original footage from Jack Torrance. Right-hand side of the screen, my footage. Same boardwalk here. Same slanted roof. Poles keeping up the roof. Broken windows on the side, on the wall, and the graffiti. It gets better. Just watch. Found the car. That car is pretty unmistakable, right? The angle is different for sure, so it gives it a slightly different look, but sure enough, that is the same car in the same spot. And here's the really exciting piece. The door. So if you really look at the door on this side, on the left hand side, you'll notice that it's got graffiti of a coffin with a cross on it on the door. On the right hand side, you'll see the same thing. With an addition that I noticed all around the building. A posted, no trespassing sign. <laughs> Private property. I highly doubt at this point that anybody legitimately owns this place. Or if they do, they are a very unfortunate owner. But, I'll say this much. Gave me a spot to put the NM card. And here you can see it even closer. The coffin with the cross. And here it is blown up a bit. Now that myself and my party members are well away from that place, I can tell you all a bit more about it. The location is an abandoned mill, and while I wanted to go inside and get footage that fully proves how closely it's tied to multiple Jack Torrance videos, there was a pretty huge problem with the idea. When my team and I had arrived, there was nobody in sight, a very big improvement from the place we had been to as our first location stop. Walking up to the door where I put the Nightmine card, however, let us know we were probably not alone. This building is truly abandoned. It's on the side of the road, pretty far from any homes or stores, and surrounded by miles of ranches, farms, and open lands. Not just anybody can walk here or would even think about doing it. So imagine our surprise when, just as we get to the door with a coffin spray painted on it, we heard noises coming from inside that sounded like an animal or a human being crying out every eight seconds or so. This building was supposed to be abandoned. Nothing around it for food or shelter, or even real homes. Just odd working government buildings and lots of open land. Something, or somebody, was inside there. And if they weren't, something had been inside recently to disturb objects enough for them to be making constant noise. It was not a bird. It was not like any animal we had ever heard before. This is why I didn't talk during my footage. It was legitimately dangerous if we let anything in there know people were outside. We agreed as quietly as we could that we would get the evidence we needed to, and leave. I collected the footage. We went back to the car. One of our party members hung back a moment, focused on a pair of old barn doors chained up with a lot of space under them to see into the building. We only found out she was staring at the doors after we left because something had caught her eye enough to focus in. Seeing a box under the door suddenly move while she was watching is what made her immediately tell us to get in the car and go. Something, or someone, was inside this place. And with Jack Torrance having no idea at the time I was even in Texas, it could not have been them. As nice as the interior footage would have been to record, we were never going to risk going back there. 
We got in the car, our nerves rattled for the second time that day after nearly being confronted by strangers in the farmlands of Texas on private property at the first stop, and we moved on. The plan that night was to do a live stream, but that's when the major breakthrough was made concerning the building from the video with the message, It is calling, will you answer? I was not about to open the floor without evidence of that building, so we headed out once more and caught it to unveil on the Stage 1 Report live stream, which aired that night on July 13th. So, we were all driving ourselves wild over that last video, right? And where that location might be? I don't think we have to wonder anymore. Even the rocks here look familiar. I did decide to go ahead and take these quick shots here, just showcasing once again the lineup between the original footage and my footage. One of the main giveaways about this location was the way that it was set up here, especially with all of this ivy that you can see right over here. This air conditioner at the top, on top of uh, this wooden and looks like metal trellis, really gave the game away. When you found this section right here, and then, of course, we have this famous spot. Hmm. What's the matter, Jack? No gift for us? I don't feel as welcome anymore. Y'all might also remember the walk up to a very spooky shack. Not so spooky anymore. Although the existence of a pillow on the floor in here is a little bit concerning. And of course now we'll go ahead and do that little wobble walk over to the side of the building. And boom! Struggle step. Fall. Foundation. I guess the only regret I have right now is that I can't track down the specific leaf that it was focused on after the end of the video. Here's a bit of information that, again, I wasn't ready to share at the time, but will do so now. Jack Torrance knew exactly what they were doing when they chose the building, because it ties into the story concepts they've been presenting perfectly. It wasn't just some abandoned building this time. It was a Freemason Lodge, with the same famous Mason symbol on the premises that could be found in one of the old Jack Torrance videos. I'm not going to tell you where it is, because I really don't want a bunch of adventurers knocking on the door and scaring some poor old men who have no concept of an alternate reality game or web series, but that is the truth. Jack Torrance sent us to a Freemason Lodge, and it was absolutely a message. A couple of days went by with no activity. My team and I waited for Jack to respond in some way, and we got more than we anticipated when they suddenly began using the YouTube community tab. A blurry photo was taken of a gazebo, with something or someone standing in front of it. Right after this, I received an email from Jack Torrance. It contained the original photo from YouTube, as well as an additional picture and a set of coordinates. Instructions were clear. Something was waiting there for me, and I was supposed to go right away. The game had just taken a new direction, incorporating one of the most immersive elements of alternate reality experiences, the geocache. This is a mechanic in which game runners leave an item for players to find, usually containing crucial information or an item to help them advance in their journey. For the very first time in my life, I was going to retrieve a geocache, and I had no idea what could be inside. The situation was tense for all of us. For all that we knew, Jack Torrance or a friend of theirs could have been hiding in the trees or somewhere nearby, watching. It didn't help that the gazebo they chose was in a cemetery. We made sure to watch ourselves on approach and clear the area before picking up the drop. We got it, came back, opened the package, and recorded the contents. I prepared the video evidence and opened my stage to report live stream. That's when Jack showed just how much fun they were going to have with us for the rest of this game by unveiling a new video right as I was about to begin. 
Fragment 26R, a recording of the same gazebo I was just about to unveil with my own video footage. Again, a message was hidden in the video description. It never ends, repeated over and over. A direct strike at exactly the right time in my stream to get me back for the surprise I gave them using my first stream. I was shaken. I was shocked. <laughs> but I was definitely impressed. I explained how I was given the coordinates and photos via email by Jack and unveiled the video footage I had from the day. Today, Jack Torrance requested that we find a very specific gazebo. The gazebo was found, but only because they sent me an email with the coordinates specifically, as well as another instruction. You can see the gazebo matches, same design, same fence in the background. Okay, so because the gazebo was found, obviously the next step was to find the water valve. When you study enough of these things, you know for a fact that if somebody gives you coordinates and they give you a location and they give you a picture of something that could have something else inside of it, it is what's known as a dead drop or a geocache. There is something to be found there for you. So, we went about finding the water valve. Located the water valves sent to me in the email. We have one here, but we also have one right here. I'm going to take these lids off and see if we get lucky. Just as suspected, it is a dead drop. Let's see what we have here. No way I can read the writing here. I'm going to check the other one and then we'll take this back. So, from the dead drop location, we did receive a package. As you can see here, we have something, or several somethings, wrapped in tin foil inside of a plastic bag with a note. Happy birthday. Probably related to the fact that my channel's birthday is this month, which is quite considerate of them. Let's see what we've got here. So, this happy birthday tag? Something fun about it. was actually written on happy birthday gift paper. Quite considerate. Let's see what we have in the tinfoil. Layer one, bubble wrap. Definitely something with a little bit of color inside of it. And I was thinking on the way back to my current location, what if this is the clown doll? The clown doll from that one location, that one video, uh, where it had the rotted out truck outside in the coffin on that one door in graffiti. Looking at it just through this, I'm thinking that might be what we have here, but I could be wrong. We'll see in just a second. I also realized, um, on the way back, and also while going through this video, that there was, in fact, another video where that little clown doll appeared. And it's quite relevant to... today. I believe the first appearance was here, in the video outside, one of the present day videos that was most likely taken by whoever was curating the actual Jack Torrance channel, who is probably in need of help right now. So, first appearance modern day, second appearance old footage, third appearance, well let's just get to it. Call me psychic, or just that I've been doing this for way too long online to not be surprised or be able to call these things, but we got it, everybody. We got the clown. And right next to it, we have what appears to be a videotape. Okay, so this is actually pretty impressive, and this answers a question that we've had for a while. How many of these videos are actually made on genuine tape? Now we have a tape that we have to get into a camera or some sort of device in order to see what's on it. I'm going to have to do some hunting around to find a connection that has this. The next step was obvious. Get that VHC tape converted and do so as quickly as possible. The next day we found a place that could do it and surrendered the VHC tape. It could be done by afternoon the following day. I took my laptop with me when we went to retrieve it. We'd watch the result in the car as soon as we got the USB drive back and see what we were dealing with. 
As long as we weren't arrested upon walking in for any sort of sick, twisted thing the employee converting the footage might have seen. That was the scary part. We had no idea what the tape had on it, so if it was more intense than cryptic, we could have been walking in to greet police or some very uncomfortable employees. Thankfully, it was only disturbing to watch for myself and my teammate as we sat in the car, not quite believing what had been done. Jack Torrance's tape was a VHC recording of my first live stream, revealing how intently they'd been watching. And the whole time we could hear noises off camera, none of them pleasant. the footage knowing this was the next step in the game. Jack wanted to see how resourceful and dedicated we were and how quickly we could keep up with his challenges. As a result, the next day another geocache command was issued, leading to another location discovered from the Jack Torrance found footage uploads. Fragment 87J. Picture 1. The top of the wall seen in the video. Picture 2. A drain pipe installed in the wall which was the same image that was posted today on Jack Torrance's channel, their community tab. Picture 3, a gazebo, supposedly at the same site. So, I did naturally what anybody else would do in this situation. Go to the coordinates as quickly as possible. Gazebo number 2. Jack Torrance is fond of gazebos. The way that the video that was referenced is set up, it has to be along the other side of this wall. So before we dig into the package, let's address what appears first and foremost in the video. The notes. They all say, I'm sorry. Right now, my thoughts are that they're apologizing for maybe a false search on a lead yesterday that I talked about online. Or it could be something I like a hell of a lot less. <laughs> could be apologizing for something that's in this bag. Let's, let's find out. Bag is open. Every last bit of packaging paper is a note that says I'm sorry. This is what we're left with. You can see a light red stain right here. All right, let's crack this open. Got the string off and found that there are more notes inside the package that say I'm sorry. And there are more stains. Result number one from the package, it's a vinyl record. Someday Sweetheart by Gene Austin. And the song on the opposite side is Forgive Me. Okay, rest of the package. Immediately opening it is a black cat ornament on a note that says, I believe I'm so sorry. 
The black cat figurine is sticky, freshly painted. The note does say, I'm so sorry. That's where the record underneath it. It's uh, another record that says, side one, Cheating by Cliff Edwards. The other side, I'll buy the ring. You can't really see it that well here, but on this figurine, there seem to be spots of hot glue and around the legs, strings attached. There's definitely one attached to the side of the head. I'm gonna need to do some closer inspection on this. This package was a lot more loaded and cryptic. Three of the four songs from the records could be found online and seemed to fit a theme. I felt, however, that we needed the full amount of information we could gather. So before working on compiling footage for the live stream, I insisted we go out so I could buy a record player. We would be able to hear the final song, and my teammates would get a housewarming gift they'd been thinking of buying themselves for a while, they admitted. So, everybody won. The result of all four songs together match up to the same sentiment. Love, remorse, condemnation for cheating, and sincere apologies. What confused me and my companions most about this is that we had no idea what Jack Torrance could possibly be sorry about. The answer came while I was discussing it on the live stream from Jack, emailing me a link to one of the videos that takes place in a graveyard. The music in the video is one of the tracks from the records we were given. Suddenly, I had a new lead. The entire time I'd been hunting down locations for Jack Torrance leading to the hits that Pouncing Dragon found, I had been concentrated on graveyards, thinking that if I could find just one, I would be able to pinpoint the search area needed. Now, the same train of thinking was part of the game. Find that graveyard. The continuation of the journey depended on it. I spent a few more hours that night staring at all the blurry red footage that could be seen on Jack's channel and trying to match it to cemeteries around the locations we'd been to. The next day, we went to the graveyards in question, including the famous, or infamous, cemetery used for the opening shot of the original Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Fragment 74F had given the game away, showing off way too many location markers. I didn't even need to look up names from headstones. Google Street View and photos from the site were all that were necessary. Nothing was there, although I did get plenty of footage, and it's a good thing too because the next day when Jack Torrance emailed us the final geocache and posted a photo on their community tab, I knew precisely where they had left the final gift. We had just been there. Before that happened though, Jack released a video to cap off the day, Fragment 85B. If there was anything terribly revealing in it, we couldn't find it. Only the secret message in the video description was obvious. All who watch shall suffer anathema. Anathema is a formal curse issued by a religious figure or a form of excommunication from a spiritual power. This message made a lot of sense the next day, when Jack summoned us to the film site from the Texas Chainsaw Massacre. We went to the graveyard, snuck up to the area, grabbed the geocache, and left as quickly as possible. It was a perfect echo of the first drop event. Get in, watch out for anybody nearby, snatch it up, and speed away. After getting back to base, we opened it up, recorded the contents, and went live. So... Today, Jack sent another email with a specific location. This time, no coordinates, just a clue as to where it was. Turns out I knew precisely where it was because I visited that location yesterday. It was that cemetery that I just got done showing you guys. Rather than drag things out with the camera this time, because again, you've just seen the location and the matchup, just went for a uh, dash and grab. And to help us with opening what seems to be the final package from Jack Torrance, we have our friend Danny here with us. A little bit of a celebration. All the dirty strings removed with what seem to be brown or maroon stains on them, blood or otherwise, leaving a dark black coffee can. Let's go ahead and pop this off and see what's inside. The first thing that jumps out when you remove the lid is all the paper. And then you see the message on the side of the lid. You should have never answered the call. Ask for forgiveness. Okay. Taking just a few of the bits of paper out of the coffee can, we see something quite unexpected. There are images of fan art of me, viewer art of me, burnt through. The first piece of paper 
is a shot from, I believe, my first video on Jack Torrance. Printed out, ripped up, burnt through. We even have tweets from some of you guys talking about the investigation. Stuff like, good job. I sense there's going to be a live stream about what's in the package. What's in the package? going through more of the paper, and there's definitely a lot of paper. The intro to the cat's eye video that I did, or rather, the thumbnail that I've been using for these live streams as I've been out in the field. Another bit of viewer art. And the most current bit of viewer art, showing me holding Danny Torrance here. All of these papers have a very strong scent coming off of them. It's either perfume, cologne, or cleaning solution of some kind. Maybe to help things burn? And just from the inside of this, I can see more black cats in here. The further we go, the more mess we find. More printouts from Twitter. Printouts of what seem to be screenshots of the package tape uploaded online. A shot from one of the live streams. More comments from you guys. I found two new black cats in here so far. You can see the shape of a very big third in here, and messages inside the can. You might have noticed already as I've been going through these and showing you guys, the papers are getting progressively dirtier, both in terms of red markings, dried red markings, and just a lot of dirt. There are more cats now, and as it goes deeper down, they get a lot dirtier. There's one right there on the inside, and of course I'll read the notes attached to the tape on the inside of the can for you, as I'm trying to get through all of this right now. So I heard of the pace a little bit here, and I counted up the cats, as well as got the big one out. This is a pile of eight small cats. The big one, the ninth, is made after me. Four eyes, perfect coloring, covered in dirt. I've made it through the rest of the coffee can. This is the height of the pile of burned images that Jack left. I found more cats, too. The total in here come up to 11. Actually, no, they come up to 10, I'm sorry. The one that I've already received from last time makes 11. The big piece makes 12. And if you're counting in me, myself, that makes 13. The inside of the coffee can, every last bit of tape says the same thing. Sequitur infectio. It's gotta be Latin. Sequitur infectio, sequitur infectio, sequitur infectio. I even had a piece fall out that I managed to put back on here. Sequitur infectio. And that's it. Apparently that's all that Jack has for us. There's a curse in place of some kind, but I'm not going to be welcome here anymore. It was right after this moment that Jack uploaded a new video, showing us all what had happened to the contents of the package before I received it and making something very clear. I was not the only one cursed. I was just the centerpiece, the head of the ritual. All of the small cats that circled and followed along, the viewers, they would all suffer in kind. All who watch shall suffer anathema. The video description also gave away something I'd been holding onto from the package, which I didn't know what to do about until Jack unveiled it. A P.O. Box address. All of us were damned and had to ask for forgiveness, an act which involved sending Jack messages following the order. My teammates' blood ran cold when they looked up the P.O. Box. They knew exactly where that post office was. They had driven past it far too many times. And that was it. The arc of the game I had been taken into was over its effect delivered. With all the information given, an idea formed about what it was Jack had been so sorry about. 
they had been sorry for the curse that was now inflicted on me, my teammates, and my viewers. And the way things were going, with all the clues in place in the context of this whole affair known, it seems we gained a better sense of the dynamic between who was running the Jack Torrance channel and the evil forces in the footage. I suspect that the channel owner and video footage converter is in fact alive, but they're cursed even more heavily than we are, a slave to whatever is exerting its power in the videos. They can't disobey, not directly, but in the times they've been able to, they have expressed remorse for their role in spreading the evil. Shortly after I left Austin, Texas, Jack shared a new picture on their community tab. A collection of envelopes. Viewers had been telling me online that they sent messages and gifts to the P.O. Box attempting to lift the curse, and it seems that Jack was actually going to reply to whoever had given them a return address. Items of repentance have been getting shown off by Jack online in collection videos since that event. The first came on August 2nd, and the video setup immediately gave a weird impression. The date set on the camera is, for some reason, March 8th, 1984. As a result of sending anything in, Jack did send something back, and viewers have been documenting their results. Everyone who received a gold envelope appeared to get the same thing, but with a little bit of variety. An old photograph in black and white, an item small enough to fit in the palm of a hand, and a letter wrapped in red string. The letter read as follows. You are lost, but I am searching for you, child. You have already taken the first step. Now I see you more clearly. I know where you are in flesh, but we must now meet on another plane. Do as I ask, so that I may be with you. Take the photo forged by my lens. Bind yourself to me. Deliver unto me your token. Document your actions and testify of my works. You must first choose your token. No larger than a clenched fist and no smaller than molar. A mere glance at it must tell me who you are. Bind your token to my photo with red twine. Prepare yourself, as I will be with you soon. Cry out to the ones in the void. You must find one who has enough strength to bind us. The older they are, the more influence they have. This will open the door. It must play until your task is complete. Do this alone as the uninvited will not be welcome. To summon one with enough influence, you must first present the aged offering I have provided you. You will not survive this if you do not show reverence. Hold the offering up and cry out for help to bind us. When the old one appears, place the offering at their feet and ask them if it will suffice. If they agree, clutch our entwined objects and recite my words. Repeat the binding word until you hear my voice. When you feel my breath, I am with you. Speak my words. I call upon you, tribute in hand. I pray my offering sufficient. Lend me your power and wisdom. I am lost and must be found. Guide him to me. Bind him to me. The one who waits with lens ripe and eager. Repeat. Invoke. Place our bonded objects under your pillow this night and dream of our joining. I am with you. My eyes in the dark see you now always. I have gazed inside and seen a wandering child searching for shelter. Now cut the twine and separate our pawns as I have found you now in spirit. Keep the offering and my photo. Now send me your token as only my lens will deliver you to me completely. I've already checked out the invocation video, and aside from breathing noises and mumbled words at the end, there isn't much to it except for footage of the woods at night and old music. Collection 2 came on August 11th, showing the same date, but a time before the hour we saw in the first video. Something is up with the recording data. We might not be able to make sense of it right away, but it is worth keeping an eye on. What's really notable about Collection 2 comes in at 3 minutes 30 seconds. Someone sent in a message that got a different sort of response from Jack than just general acknowledgement. That someone turned out to be Pouncing Dragon, who made the breakthroughs necessary to locate Jack for this entire journey to begin. Because of the shoutouts I gave on my live streams, Jack knew exactly what part Pouncing played in the field investigation effort. The response Jack gave Pouncing in Collection 2 was a repackaging of their gift to the tune of Happy Birthday. Jack then dug a hole, buried Pouncing's items, and left a marker. Now, why did they do that? Good question, and we really don't have an answer to it yet ourselves. But the burial is not all that Jack did. Pouncing Dragon recently received a package from Jack that was quite bigger than the envelopes others have been getting. Inside was the following. A stuffed plush dragon with a stitched up back. 
a birthday present that, unwrapped, was revealed to be a lockbox filled with sticks, dirt, rocks, leaves, and a plastic container. Inside the plastic container was... a taxidermy cat's paw, wrapped up and marked with a pendant, one side saying lucky, the other saying you. Pouncing believes it's one of two messages. Either it's a little bit of ill will towards me, or they're being called a cat's paw, which means they've just been a pawn this entire time. Lucky them. The stuffed dragon revealed the final gift inside when the stitches were cut open. A VHSC tape, just like I received in my first geocache. Pouncing recently had it converted, and here is the result. It seemed to be another geocache, another play in the game, but there was a problem. Jack Torrance knew I wasn't around, they knew Pouncing was not around, and the way things have gone lately, the field of play has been public. A choice had to be made. Open the geocache to everybody, or send one of my field agents. I went on Twitter and my YouTube community tab to call Jack on this one. They responded a day later, emailing me this message. This is for you or the dragon only. Send one of your field agents to collect if needed, but do not share this location with the other damned. 
and I didn't share it, but I did send one of my field agents to retrieve that item. It turned out to be a USB drive taped to the bench, the contents of which were... very unsettling. And we'll get to them in just a moment after acknowledging something we need to touch on first, because it highlights the importance in my response to what Jack left us. Four videos have come out since Collection 2, three of them dealing with tokens sent in by the damned who asked for forgiveness, and a third collection video. Token 132 is a video that involves the sound of distressed horses throughout and shows off an item received by Jack Torrance corresponding to addressy number 132. Jack bleeds themselves over a bowl, sets fire to it and then leaves it, filled with blood and something that appears organic, all placed inside a salt or flower layout that represents the symbol for Ma, the reverse of Om or Omega. This is an act of defiance against the traditional sense of Omega or Om, which stands for the divine and the height of holy power. It's also been known throughout time to represent electric current relationships and electrical conductance. This act of binding and reciprocation by Jack to the token can be seen as a form of conductive relationship, a current being fully formed. In the darkness toward the end, something seems to emerge, brought forward by the ritual. Token 74 involves a claw taken from a backpack in the woods, which is pressed into the neck of a bloodied and bound person being kept in a dark location. At the end, we see someone moving around. It looks like they're laying out a circle for a ritual centered around the object cast in white. Token 2 takes us through the halls of a school to a soundtrack of tortured pigs. Again, we're taken to what seems like a basement where the token is shown off and the sound of the Easter Bunny toy from ages ago during the early days of the Jack Torrance channel can be heard. The camera floats over to a load of blankets, which seem to have someone or something moving underneath. And now, Collection 3, the latest public video. It's still shown to be March 8th, 1984, but the time is again different, taking us to nearly 11pm. After reviewing the new load of items, Jack takes us outside to a gallery in the woods. The final art piece is given very special focus. The clown doll, who we named Danny Torrance with the Phantom of Jack leaning over him. The eyes are left as the final focus, and the video closes. The tokens we've seen are not the entirety of what Jack has been given. I know that because on the USB drive, Jack showed off exactly how many have been granted in tribute for the binding practice. There are precisely 13, including the item sent by my ally Pouncing Dragon, and the tokens are not at all the end piece of the USB contents. I was not prepared for what had been left at the latest drop site. None of us on the investigation team were. The first folder was called Ask, leading through a string of folders to deliver a message. Ask for forgiveness. All are damned. Five subfolders are shown with odd names. Four letters and one clearly marked help. Within the folders are files that are also marked with letters and numbers. Folder A contains pictures and screenshots Jack felt were appropriate to include. In some ways, I can tell you that myself and the investigation team are absolutely being taunted. We are being mocked to our faces by some of these pictures, but some of them are also meant to help. Folder C contains the full amount of old photographs that Jack's been pulling from to send gift pictures to addressees. They all have something in common besides being black and white. They were developed at Studer's Photography in San Antonio, Texas. One of the screenshots that were included in the A folder contains a tweet by a viewer, Mr. Enigma, who did some work studying the photos that everybody's been getting and hit a lead. Ben J. Studer, the man who opened the photography studio. His grave bears the mark of a Freemason. Again, we've been pointed to Freemasonry as a player in the whole story, with Mr. Studer being implicated in a heavy way as a direct cause of events. Folder K held the token items Jack has received by this point. All of them were marked by the letter T, and I know you want to get into the help folder right away, but we need to visit folder J in order for it to make the most sense. Inside J are five text documents and a subfolder called The Flesh. The first text document, O, has only a number, 908. This turned out to be the combination to that lockbox that Pouncing Dragon was sent. It's possible that we were only supposed to open it after finding this USB drive, but Pouncing got it open before the code delivery. The documentation is a list of YouTube video links showing the invocation recordings by those interacting with Jack Torrance. The invocation file contains a link to the invocation video itself. And the letter is, of course, the letter with the original link to the invocation video that we read earlier. The list is a mass list of those who sent forgiveness requests to the P.O. Box. Everybody who has reached Jack Torrance by this point is written down in here. And now for the truly unnerving part of all of this. The Flash. 
It's a collection of screenshots of the places where members of Jack's forgiveness list are living, taken from Google Street View. He knows where you live, and he knows what it looks like. Now for the grand reveal. This, finally, is where everything comes together. Inside are two files, a video called Stop and a text file titled the same. The text reads, You must stop or the infection spreads. Here is the video. Did you hear what was being said this time? It's the first video in which we can truly hear something with ease, and it tells us everything we need to know where we stand right now, at last, in all of this madness. Here's the video with audio cleaned up a bit. This is someone saying no over and over and over again, obviously in distress. They're trying to actively resist something but their body seems to be acting on its own. It sounds like a woman and she sounds like she's suffering. Remember the first cry for help we received? This is just like that moment. And if you have any doubt, have you given any consideration to the odd choice and titles for these folders and files from the USB drive? A. P. C. S. J. O. K. T. It's a letter jumble, and it breaks down into just two words. Stop. Jack. And with all of this information at our fingertips at last, I'm ready to call the situation as I can finally see it. This is the story behind the channel, Jack Torrance. In the mid-1900s, there existed a prominent photography studio chain in the area of San Antonio, Texas called Studer's, founded and operated by Mr. Ben J. Studer. According to his obituary, Mr. Studer's company owned several studios, granting access to an array of developing camera tech and processing labs. Studer was a Freemason, and a very proud one, choosing to leave his mortal remains in the Anchor Masonic Lodge Cemetery, where he could bear the mark of Freemasonry on his headstone. The Masons have been related to occult activity throughout time by conspiracy theorists, and while it's unkind and unfair to point fingers at the entire practice as a form of modern occultism, it's more than possible that certain lodges and breakaway portions of Freemasonry could have practiced in the arcane. It's in the same way that lighter covens of modern paganism and Wicca have splintered from their original groups to form more concentrated practices over the years. You can find whispers online about a leviathan curse that affects generations of families whose ancestors were Freemasons, brought about by the rituals engaged in by occultist Masons. The idea of Freemasonry being wrapped up in the occult is not a new concept, but it is one that this story is definitely pushing. This is the idea presented by the evidence that Jack Torrance insists on concerning the old San Antonio branch during the early 1900s. Mr. Studer and his fellow Lodge members were apparently involved in forbidden works, which can be witnessed through videos like Fragment 27F, one of the shakiest and oldest examples of found footage as part of the collection, placing it around the necessary time period following Studer's death for practices he established or was involved in. 
The channel uploader in modern day who began Jack Torrance on YouTube may have listed the Mason Lodge video as Super 8 footage, but they easily could have been mistaken. If we're following the line of allegations correctly, one could assume that Studer and his fellow occultists must have had access to an entire chain of cameras and development resources, meaning they could have been using cameras that predated the Super 8. It would have been entirely too tempting for members of an occult lodge to refrain from using bleeding-edge recording technology to capture evidence of their work succeeding. And if somebody knew about what they were up to from the inside, they could have been recorded without knowing it, which is what the action in Fragment 27F certainly suggests. Following the evidence from the boxes of footage that were converted, it seems that Suter's branch succeeded in tapping into the supernatural, bringing some form of being into this realm from the darker side of reality. We have footage of cult members, arcane objects, rituals, and paranormal events throughout the first few years of Jack Torrance uploads. There are people seen investigating, disappearing, and being haunted. Whatever made contact through the oldest film reels was carried through into this world and the newer footage shows us the results. And if Jack's letter is anything to be trusted, then that means the spirit has been active even as early as the 1950s and 40s, claiming that the photographs were taken from their lens. It's unknown what time exactly Mr. Studer and his associates could have brought the spirit of Jack Torrance into this realm, but when it crossed over, it did find a host body, and it took a lot of pictures with it that it is now sending us in the modern day. Speaking of modern day, as footage was converted from the old estate sale boxes, the owner of the Jack Torrance channel was exposed to the evidence of occult worship over and over again, as well as remnants of the spirit's activity. Just like Jay and Marble Hornets, the more they watched, the stronger the effect of whatever spirit that haunted the footage became. It was when VHS Fragment 25N was uploaded revealing a monster in existence that activity stopped cold, and it's no wonder why. The being had shown itself, capitalizing on the effect being built over years of video conversion. The ultimate infection point occurred on that day, March 17th, 2015, and for nearly one year, the channel creator and uploader stayed away from YouTube. The only recording they did from that point came in the form of capturing their new home under construction. Maybe they wanted to record it due to how exciting the event was. Maybe they wanted some way to cleanse the channel by turning it into a brand new, more personal direction. Maybe they could get both of those feelings taken care of in one shot. But whatever was found in the footage had not gone away, and it made sure to establish its presence through the items left in the home before attacking. This is why converted footage resumed. The channel uploader, who had stayed away as long as they could, had been attacked and brought back under the influence of the monster present in the videos. They took barely any time at all to resume uploads, and when they did, footage was released showing ties to all of the other pieces, including the origin of the clown figurine. Trapped by something they had never meant to encounter or release to the public, the uploader attempted to fight the influence of the spirit, who will now refer to officially as THE Jack behind Jack Torrance. The uploader's rebellion came in the form of a secret message, help, written four times and inserted into the same old copy and paste text in every video description. And for over two years, that cry for help went unanswered. Two years went by of Jack's influence driving itself deeper into the life of the uploader. Until finally, one of them, Jack, or the uploader, put out that livestream message. Find me. Considering the nature of the title and lack of video description, I'm thinking it was the uploader being held hostage who got the word out. Find me. Please, I need your help. And without knowing it, I answered the monster instead, who was now deep enough in control of the uploader to put them through the paces of modern work and recording. Jack Torrance the Spirit was the one that taunted me into coming to Texas and playing our game, leaving clues and packages behind for me to pick up and then show off to the audience. And for every bit of control the uploader could take, they tried to get a message across again and again. This is why they were sorry. The uploader was aware of what was happening to them, to us. They knew an infection was being spread. Sequitur infectio, infection to follow. They were a cat's paw too, a pawn in the game that Jack was playing with all of us, trying to go viral. And they succeeded at it. I played directly into the monster's hands, getting us all pulled into the ritual and opening the floodgates for worshippers to pick up where the Struder cult had left off. The more worship paranormal beings experience, the stronger they become. They're emovoric, feeding off emotions and attention to survive and gain power. YouTube was the audience they needed, and as viewership and fascination grew, so did Jack's grip on the uploader. The ritual requested of addressees from the P.O. Box is so clear. Worship me. Bind yourself to me. Subjugate your will in my favor. 
Make yourself my host. There was never any forgiveness to ask for. It was a ploy. Just a vindictive spirit seeking to cripple us by forcing an apology to make us feel subservient so they could assert their will and control. This was a manipulation tactic, and it worked. We've all been victims of a selfish, corrupt entity, and now the source of infection, the proxy operating on Jack's behalf, is trying to fight it off and make it clear they need our help, and that we can put Jack down for good if we try. People are dying now, or at the very least they're being captured and put through hell. The uploader and ourselves are not the only ones who need rescuing. Stop sending messages to that P.O. box. If you're about to respond to the ritual, deny it. We've seen the light, and now it's time for us to fight back. But this is going to take a team effort, so your help is needed. I'm going to do my best in a separate video after this one to undo what's been inflicted on us, and it's only because of the uploader's efforts that I'm able to. We were given the evidence of the flesh for a reason, and the same goes for that list of names. The uploader knew it could be used to set the afflicted free. Complete free will is necessary for any form of ritual to actually work. It involves knowing what someone is doing and being entirely aware of the effects and their own intention, in tandem with the spirit. By keeping you all ignorant, Jack provided one hell of a loophole. We're going to run a knife right through it and tear this thing open. Step number one. Go to the invocation video, hit the dislike button, and write the following in the comment section, especially if you did the ritual. Reject. 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 Reject Jack Torrance. Show him your displeasure. Make him burn. Step 2. Join me on the video that's going to be uploaded right after this. It needs to be a separate video if it's going to have the necessary impact. Jack needs to see this, and so does his host body. This is now a fight for someone's soul. That's all I can impart right now concerning this whole affair. I've given everything I can in the whole story so far, and now we're at a point of action. As far as games go online, for alternate reality or otherwise, this is one of those make-a-choice moments. It's time for us to step up. This case is not quite over yet. It is not closed. But for the moment, my coverage is done. Please excuse the weird transition, but we do have to wrap up for tonight. I've got something I need to prepare to see if we can get our uploader friend the help they need and do a little bit of cutting of ties on our end too. Thanks to all of you for tuning in, and major thanks especially to all of my supporters on Patreon, who made it possible in the first place to even go to Austin, engage in this whole crazy adventure, and bring you the results alive night after night. Events that are this bizarre, sudden, and wild do take support from viewers to pull off. From the price of plane tickets to go halfway across the country in a moment's notice to the money needed to suddenly pay for an old videotape to be converted. Jack Torrance is a special case, but doing things this crazy for Nightmind is a possibility that I always want open for us. If you want to see more endeavors and field investigations like these, please consider supporting the Patreon. Even the smallest amount monthly helps make tearing through graveyards and live streaming mystery packages on the channel a reality for the future. Please do stick around to the end of this video to see the names of all of the incredible supporters who made this Nightmind case file the most exciting story I've ever had the privilege to cover, and do consider joining them to make the next one a reality too. That's it for now everyone. Join me over on the following video as we use the contents of the USB to do what we can, and remember to hit that invocation video to help fight Jack. I'll leave the link to it in the video description here. Thanks for joining me in the dark again this evening. And for all of you who helped make the Texas Field investigation possible, thank you. Seriously, you made this real, and I am eternally grateful. This entire adventure only exists because you gave me the power to go after it. Once more, I'm Nick Nocturne, and just like a message from an evil spirit playing geocache chess, I'll be calling you back real soon. Join me on the following video, and then sleep tight.